Good afternoon. My name is Noah Mish. I'm a uh, PostgreSQL contributor. And I'm here to talk about some of the ways that an automated test you write can pass on your own machine yet fail on some slice of the build farm. My goal here really is to give you some things to look for, both when writing your own tests and reviewing tests that others have submitted, uh, in order to increase the probability that the build farm will like your test. So many of you are familiar with the PostgreSQL build farm already, but I'll give a brief introduction of it. Uh, this is how PostgreSQL has implemented continuous integration for the core PostgreSQL code. The, a number of volunteers run machines that are regularly building and testing Postgres and submitting the test results from those runs to a central database that the community sysadmin team operates. And this is actually one of the most popular ways to assist PostgreSQL development. During the month of April, a total of 36 owners had machines that were reporting in results. So uh, if you're not involved in PostgreSQL development now and you don't know how to start, this is actually a, a really low cost way to do something that really helps development. Um, in particular, we need machines that are something other than x86 GNU slash Linux. So if you have one of those, you're especially welcome. Uh, go to buildfarm.postgresql.org uh, for instructions on how to get set up. The real benefit of the build farm is that we learn about portability problems quite quickly, uh, usually within 24 hours of the patch that introduces them. Uh, when I was involved in projects in the past that didn't have something like this, all too often we'd learn about a portability problem, say, the day after release. Somebody would show up and say, oh, it hasn't compiled on Solaris in six months. Well, that doesn't happen for Postgres, thanks to the build farm. Um, the cost of this really is, and I should say also another benefit is that sort of our secondary test suites get run often, whereas they might not otherwise. So if someone were to break plain old make check on every system, we'd probably notice that quickly within a day or so anyway, just because so many hackers are running that test suite. But if we were to, say, break the ECBG test suite and we're relying on a human notice that, that could go a week or two, perhaps. Um, that doesn't happen with the build farm. The cost of this, uh, on the other hand, is that a hacker, usually multiple hackers, are manually assessing every failure, pulling up the list of build farm status results, looking at all the red ones, and figuring out, is this in fact a bug or something just wrong on the individual build farm member, et cetera. And we have, in many cases, missed bugs for a while because there's a bunch of noise from spurious failures, kind of drowning out the small amount of signal from, uh, from the real failures. So it's important, I think, to continue whacking down those spurious failures so that we can actually catch the real problems when they get added and not spend too much time looking at the same spurious failures all over and over again. So what are some of the ways that a build farm member can fail besides the obvious bug introduced? Uh, a fair number of them are caused by problems on the individual build farm member. For example, machine runs out of disk space or a machine has a, an update to its system software that's no longer compatible with Postgres. Uh, particularly common example of that system upgrade causing a problem. Whenever there's a new Python 3 release series, it almost always breaks the PL Python tests. So if a build farm member updates before uh, anyone else has updated manually on their development system, tend to get a, a, something from that. These kinds of things happen fairly often, maybe a couple times a month. Um, then, of course, there are the cases where we actually commit something that's not portable. And that happens somewhat often, too, maybe uh, once a month to once a month to months, once a week, I would say. But those are usually fixed quite quickly. You know, if somebody commits something that breaks every Solaris member, uh, it would be unusual for that to sit around not being fixed for more than a day or so. Um, what I'll be talking about mostly in this talk is the race conditions that cause build farm failures. Um, these are chronic failures, intermittent failures. They can last a while because they're more expensive to debug and easier to confuse with sort of just 
problems caused by the member as opposed to caused by the code. What kind of race conditions in particular? Well, as you might expect, uh, slow systems are more likely to have race conditions. In the build farm, that's mostly uh, systems using MIPS hardware or ARM hardware. Also, members that use the clobber cache always setting, which effectively turns your machine into a slow machine regardless of its underlying hardware performance. Um, so you, you, you might... <laughs> Yeah, but uh, convenient side effect, right, Andrew? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's those, but actually those are perhaps not quite as susceptible as the machines that have highly variable performance. The same machines that have good average case performance, but occasional terrible performance. Uh, my favorite example of this is Build Farm member Shearwater. Uh, if you're in the room, owner of Build Farm member Shearwater, and you want to claim your prize, uh, feel free to <laughs> raise your hand. Uh, this uh, build farm member is defunct now, but uh, it was one of the faster machines in terms of average case performance. Like the, the make of the core PostgreSQL source code took maybe 50 seconds or something, kind of on the fast side. But um, occasionally it would just run 100x as slow as it should be on, on some part of its test suite. And it encountered a lot of race condition failures as a result of that. Um, Sort of on a different tack from either of those are race condition failures caused by auto vacuum. This can affect both slow and fast machines. So in pretty much any test suite that's being run on the build farm, auto vacuums in its default configuration, spinning up every, 50, every 60 seconds to see whether any tables in the database need work. So if you have a test suite that runs in, say, 45 to 150 seconds, most of those tests are going to run from start to finish without auto vacuum having started up during the test. That's on any given machine. But since the build farm, member has, build farm has so many members with such different performance characteristics, somewhere in the build farm, your test is probably overlapping with an auto vacuum run. And if your test behaves differently when auto vacuum runs in the middle of the test, this can cause your test to fail. Uh, Typical example of how this happens is a test that runs explain. Uh, you have your test, it creates a table, does a series of modifications and reads against that table. One of those uses explain. Uh, generally, a query plan is going to be different for the case where there's no record in PG Statistic for a table versus the case where PG Statistic has the usual stats corresponding to the data in the table. So, if AutoVacuum runs in the middle of that test, throws a helpful analyze on your table, it could easily make the explain give different results. We see this relatively often. Um, also, some more specialized tests. Notice the locks that AutoVacuum takes, or notice the XLog records that AutoVacuum creates. So those are less common. Explain is the more common case, but all of this happens. And in a way, a lot of these race conditions are just the things that happen in production eventually. So Build Farm's not really being too cruel to us. It's just what happens. So now I'm going to walk through the process of debugging a stack of race conditions that affected one particular Build Farm member. The name of it was Turn. By the way, you'll hear uh, hackers affectionately refer to Build Farm members as animals due to the naming scheme, things like chipmunk, narwhal, turn. Etc. Reindeer. Um, the turn is a machine that's running AIX. It has relatively modern CPU performance, relatively modern bulk I/O performance. Uh, not great bulk I/O performance, but typical. Uh, however, it has extremely poor file system metadata operation performance. So, to illustrate what I mean, if you were to write a hundred megabyte file, just one file, it'd take about two seconds on this machine. So it's about the performance you get on a typical desktop computer um, with, with a spinning, spinning rust uh, for storage. But if you write 5,000 files that together total 100 megabytes, it takes about 60 seconds on this machine, which is way worse than you're going to get on your typical desktop computer. So that sort of sets the background for some of the race conditions that we're going to see here. Um, by the way, this machine's part of the GCC compile farm, which is a set of uh, machines that offer accounts to developers. So 
if any of you um, dislike your free time enough to want to use this machine, feel free uh, do a web search for GCC Compile Farm. And uh, despite the name, it gives accounts to all kinds of free software developers, not just GCC developers. So you'll be eligible for getting an account. Incidentally, I created this Build Farm member because AIX linking is just weird enough that we've managed to break AIX in multiple major releases. And uh, unfortunately, the level of popularity of AIX is such that we always hear about it. It's just usually something like six months after release that we hear about it. So I kind of got tired of that and uh, decided to make this Build Farm member. Now, this investigation got kicked off because in the first week or two of this being reporting into the Build Farm, there was a sequence of four runs in which three of them failed, all in the PG Rewind test suite, um, specifically in the databases test of the PG Rewind test suite. So I wanted to investigate this. Unfortunately, this was the bad old days before Andrew uh, improved the build farm script to capture all the relevant logs for a TAP test suite. So all we saw was this, uh, dubious, test return 25 which didn't tell me a whole lot about what had actually gone wrong. So my first step was to take it out of the build farm context and run this particular test in a loop uh, in my own, my own console. And that told me that the problem was promotion was timing out. We have a 30 second timeout waiting for a standby to respond to a promote signal and become a, a freestanding Postgres cluster. It took longer than that. This, by the way, is a picture of Build Farm member churn at about age eight days. All right, so at this point, I could have just raised that timeout to you know, 300 seconds, and maybe that would have been good enough. But I was kind of curious. This is my downfall, by the way. I was kind of curious why was it being so much slower to promote uh, compared to all the other Build Farm members. So the first thing I did was take a bunch of the logging options that we set for all the PG regress test suites, but we don't set for the TAP test suites, which, by the way, wouldn't be a bad thing to set all those for the TAP test suites. But in any case, I just made a local modification to set them here. And that led me a little bit further down the rabbit trail to find that it was taking 108 seconds to apply all the wall that was pending to be applied. Uh, and that is a prerequisite for, for promoting, at least under default settings. Um, at this point, I, I realized in particular that it was mostly spending time in the replay of create database statements. Create database is a particularly expensive record to replay because it's actually copying an entire directory tree and then f-syncing every file in that directory tree. So again, I said this machine has slow file system metadata operations that includes things like rename, open, f-sync, etc. So that was kind of abusing the system. So the next thing I did at that point was commit a fix to disable f-sync for this particular, for actually for all of the TAP test suites. Um, we had already disabled it for most of our test suites, so it's kind of just an oversight that we hadn't disabled it for this one. That reduced the typical time for promote on this machine to about 15 to 25 seconds. Uh, which was still pretty close to the 30 second limit, so I figured it was pretty likely I'd have to raise that time out anyway. Um, but this shaved about 10 minutes off the overall test suite run, so I was still pretty content with that. So I kicked off my loop over that test case again just to see, okay, is it stable now? Maybe it will be. Um, that led to a different failure, tail copy query result matches. Um, this one was a lot easier to work through, or it was easy to work through in any case, because uh, Christoph Berg had already reported it as a 9.5 open item, and Michael Paquier had already provided a patch that was going to uh, fix it. So I, uh, th the nature of the failure was that we were, the test driver script was sending the promote request to the standby before it had even read all the relevant wall from the master. So, the standby happily replied and proceeded to promote, not yet having the data that it needed in order to pass the test that we were going to run against it. So the nature of the fix was simply to pull the replication status and 
wait until all the wall and wait until the wall position received on the standby was the same as the wall that had been generated on the master. So that cleared up that particular problem pretty quickly. After this, um, I was sort of thinking back to that 30 second promote and wondering whether it was in fact just machine load or whether it might point to a defect in PostgreSQL. The reason I wondered that is of all the runs I had done, only three of them took more than uh, 10 seconds to promote. Uh, so, you know, 30 seconds was a fairly conspicuous outlier relative to that. So I decided to add a little more instrumentation. I modified the, first I increased the timeout from 30 seconds to 900 seconds in my local copy, because uh, 900 seconds should be enough for everybody, right? Then I modified the test driver script to collect a stack trace every second while waiting for promotion. So I figured if I looked at those stack traces and saw, for example, that the startup process was um, stuck in the kernel somewhere, that would tend to corroborate that it was mere machine load making things take a while. Uh, if there were some other stack trace, then who knows? Maybe I'd think of some defect that that explains. Um, so I let that run for a little while, and uh, surprisingly, the next thing I encountered was a promote that timed out after 900 seconds. Uh, so much for thinking that would be enough. Um, looking at the stack traces, I found that the startup process was just idly waiting for, for wall to arrive. Every five minutes, a checkpoint would happen, and a checkpoint record would arrive, and an XID assignment record would arrive. And that was the only activity until it timed out after 900 seconds. Never in that time did it acknowledge the promote request. So it was almost as if the promote request had just been lost or something like that. Um, would anyone like to venture a guess about what might explain these symptoms? That's a good guess, yeah. Uh, just for the sound record. Uh, there's a guess that uh, we should have been calling check for interrupts in a place where we weren't. Other guesses? Different signal handling, Different signal handling behavior on AIX. Yeah, that's a good idea. Is that any better? <laughs> all right, well, if, if you all can hear me, then good enough. Um, any other guesses? Well, don't feel too bad because I actually didn't have a whole lot of idea myself. I figured that perhaps uh, the startup process managed to block or ignore the signal at some point. Uh, even less likely, but sort of possible, I figured maybe this, the postmaster had recorded the wrong PID for the startup process. Didn't seem likely. Um, but. Uh, I did a couple things at that point to try to rule out those theories. One, I modified the postmaster to resend the signal if the startup process had not act the promote within a certain amount of time. And the other thing I did was run truss on each startup process throughout the test. Uh, truss, for any of you not familiar, is the equivalent of S trace on the Linux uh, side. So I figured if that showed me that uh, the starter process was changing its signal mask or something like that, I might, uh, might have a clue at that point. Unfortunately, that turned out to be something of a dead end. Uh, the starter process ignored the initial promote signal and every subsequent promote signal throughout the 900 second period, so no luck with that. And quite oddly, Truss actually failed to attach to the startup process in the one run that, that uh, ended up resulting in a failure. So no such luck with that line of inquiry. So the next thing I was going to do is dig the information I needed out of slash proc. Uh, on AIX, this contains uh, binary files that have details like the set of pending signals, the signal mask, uh, all the signal handler registrations of a process. So I figured if I looked at that information for the startup process, I would definitely know where that signal was waiting, if indeed it was waiting. Uh, unfortunately, as I said, these are binary files. The two, AIX does provide 
some primitive tools for reading them, but they were too simplistic to get all the information I just described. So I wrote a small C program to extract all those things, uh, characteristics of the signal state of the process. And I modified the test driver script to run that diagnostic process every second while waiting for promotion. And that fortunately provided the clue that I needed. Um, see in this output here, the PR sig pen line tells you that the process did indeed have uh, the postmaster signal waiting to be processed. Um, the next two lines may not mean much at a glance, but I'll tell you that those are the same process status flags that you would see if the process had GDB attached to it and it, the process were stopped waiting for GDB to control it. So I'm now pretty confident that what happened here was that when trust failed to attach, it left the process in an inconsistent state where the kernel believed that the process was being debugged and modified signal delivery to the process on the assumption of a debugger present to handle signals. Yet the debugging process was already gone, so it was as though the signals were just lost. So my monitoring inflicted this particular problem. Uh, if I had not tried to gather stack traces, this probably would not have failed at 900 seconds in this way. Oh well. <laughs> So I took off the S-trace and uh, GDB-based monitoring, and I just let it run to uh, see how it failed next. This time it ran for a full six days before it failed. Um, failed this way with database names, PSQL exit code as the error. Um, what actually happened underneath is that while starting up a postmaster with PG control w start, the postmaster reached its max connections of 10 uh, without actually successfully starting up. So what caused this? Well, P PG control dash W starts calls PQ ping with a five second timeout to decide whether the postmaster has started up or not. So every five seconds for 50 seconds, PG control sent a new PQ ping request, which timed out, but the back end was still there. And at the end of the 50 seconds, it had opened 10 back ends, all of them were still there, and it couldn't open any more because we had reached max connections. So I'd like to pause again. Can I have some guesses about what might cause this particular symptom? Anyone? Well. <laughs> Well, I had even less clue about this one, to be honest, than I had about the first one. I really didn't know at all. Um, so I modified this, the, used my old modification of the driver script to have, uh, while PG control was running, notice when the back end count had gotten above a fairly arbitrary number, I used seven, and then SIG stop all the back ends, run GDB on them, see what their stack trace was. And that, uh, that provided the answer that they were all stuck in I.O. in the task of populating their rel cache. Um, since, this, since BG Control is making the very first connections after a postmaster startup, there are no rel cache init files. So the first backend has to build the rel cache the hard way, actually scanning catalogs. Um, and the machine was presumably under extremely heavy I.O. load, so this was very slow. And then once you have five backends trying to do it simultaneously, it's even slower, amplifying the effect. And eventually you get up to, to 10 backends. This is pretty rare even on this machine. I, uh, a after I made this modification, I ran the, this test case for 28 days straight. And in that time, there were only four occasions in which it reached seven backends. So I haven't even bothered to modify PostgreSQL to be resilient to this case because it's so rare. But if I were going to modify it, I'd probably do something like either just raise the max connection in that test case to, say, 100, which would be the easiest thing. Uh, another thing I might consider doing if it comes to that is teach PG Control to back off its timeout a little bit. You know, 
if you failed two five second timeouts, maybe it doesn't make sense to do a third and fourth and fifth five second timeout. Maybe it should do, it should scale up its timeouts a little bit. I don't know. I don't remember the conversation, but it's very possible. Hmm. Anyway, so um, that brought me to the end of, of turns, a little, uh, little uh, exercise here. Um, it's been relatively stable for, for the past several months. Any questions at this point? So that was maybe entertaining, but uh, again, my goal here really is to give you some things to look for in writing or reviewing patches so that you can have a better faith than uh, Turn had with the PG Rewind test suite. So some kind of rules of thumb that I took out of this. Anytime you do something that involves I.O., you should really assume it could take tens of seconds because on the worst machines, it generally will, at least some of the time. Even things that don't do any I.O. can definitely take several seconds. Uh, a case that really surprised me was a reset statement, resetting a guck value, taking greater than two seconds on one occasion, uh, or actually on many occasions, uh, but one particular part of the code. Um, general rule for here, not, not rocket science, is if you have some asynchronous operation, pull for it frequently, but pull with a very long timeout. Uh, we have examples of this in several places in our tests, we have DB link test suite, stats.sql, uh, PG Rewind, test suite. Uh, all these places have something where we say pull every 100 milliseconds, time out after 30 seconds or something like that. That's a good pattern to copy. Uh, don't make that ti ladder timeout too low. Uh, any timeout less than 10 milliseconds is almost always wrong or you know, we'll, we'll almost always fail eventually on one of the build farm members. Anything less than 10 seconds? Yeah, 10 milliseconds is definitely hopeless. But uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, but even like five seconds usually will eventually will eventually fail. Um, I mentioned earlier in the talk vacuum, the possibility that auto vacuum will throw an analyze into your test suite and make it fail. So if you're writing a test case that includes an explain command or is kind of a low-level test sensitive to details of the heap. It can be good to try modifying your test to inject a vacuum analyze command and see whether that changes the results. And if it does, you probably want to modify your test so that it doesn't matter whether the vacuum analyze happens or not. Um, a couple ways you can do that are just run the analyze yourself. Um, also, you can use a rel option to disable auto vacuum on your table so that it doesn't matter, so that it will never touch your table. Um, and just kind of a meta observation, this talk has mostly been about cases where the test is wrong, but it's perfectly okay and sometimes better to make the core code more predictable instead of making the test more defensive. So some examples of where we've done this recently, um, Tom, De Tom Lane demoted the PG stat wait timeout um, message that had been causing failures for a long time. Just concluded that it wasn't, wasn't a necessary message to be presenting to the user and that, is, that saved us from making a lot of tests more complicated. Um, another good example was um, Tom Lane and Mikel Paquier recently modified the PG control test suite to detect the exit of the child postmaster in a more uh, timing resilient way. Um, so that saved us from having to modify tests to deal with some weird corner cases involving postmaster startup timing. So do things like that uh, when the opportunity arises. You don't necessarily have to make tests work around silly stuff in the postmaster core code. And uh, that's all. Any uh, questions I can answer? Mikhail?
Yeah. Yeah, Mikhail's saying that the build farm helped a lot with the um, degree-based trigonometric functions, just finding all the weird floating point behavior bugs that, uh, yeah, and compiler optimization variations and all that. That's definitely true. Uh, that is a good question. I actually have a list of build farm members that I think we need. I can uh, send it to you, but um, let me just think offhand. Yeah, T Thomas just men mentioned that uh, we didn't have a NetBSD member. Yeah, that really surprised me when that happened. Well, we didn't have a home. We didn't have oh, didn't have yeah, a... Uh, didn't have a, br a modern FBSD member. Oh, we have that? We have Prime members. Oh, really? Pike Grinder. Oh, yeah. Cool. 14% in data. I think that realization drove people to, to fill that gap. Um, <coughs> I'm trying to think. Probably something involving non-Linux, non non-free uh, OS would probably be the thing we're missing most. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which one, though. We have. Decent Solaris coverage. I think we have two Solaris members. Um, two. Say again? Uh, I think Risk OS is sufficiently dead that we don't need to worry about it. Yeah. Um, Which things? Uh, I read that about the Hmm. Huh. Yeah. I mean, uh, something like another HP UX machine with uh, ACC running Itanium or something like that would be good. Uh, because I think we have one that runs about half the time or something like that. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah, which is, I, I'm not uh, maligning the people who run it because I'm glad I don't have to try to run it. <laughs> oh, really? All right. Well, that's no fun. Yeah, cron job monthly reboot or something. Um, Yeah. I wonder why. I don't know why either, but uh, <laughs> there might be something like there's relatively cheap ARM multi uh, Linux tools now. Um, yeah, but even if it's free, it's kind of like the app is just basically free to push it on. Yeah, Andres mentioned multi socket machines. I agree. And even if you can't dedicate a machine to run continuously, even if you can allocate, say, one hour a week in which your big multi-socket machine runs runs its well, one hour wouldn't quite be enough, but two at two or three hours to do a full set of runs on a on a fast uh, fast hardware that would be a lot better than nothing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could run, say, master in the latest branch every every week, and maybe once a month run the others or something. Or just run them concurrently because if the machine is big enough. Good point. <laughs> yeah, if you're trying to detect multi-socket problems, that might actually be better than running it serially. Good point. Um, any other questions or comments?
Yeah, I like the naming scheme. I mean, you, I can recognize the same member being reported over and over again, which I probably wouldn't. I know I wouldn't if it was, you know, BF104, <laughs> BF109. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for coming and um, enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>